Hare Krishna, good morning. Good morning to you, Maladi. Thank you for uh, joining us. Usually, I uh, I give a bio, a little bio of each devotee that speaks to us, but uh, I have a hard time getting bios from devotees, either for due to false or real humility. They seldom send anything that makes any sense. They say, "Well, just you know, I'm trying to be a devotee and all that stuff." So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in your hands to give a little intro about yourself. And actually, if you'd ask me, I have because I do these calls so frequently. Oh. I actually have one, but um, yeah. Anyway, my name is Malati Devi Dasi, and I. Um, First met Srila Prabhupada and was initiated two days later in January of 1967 in San Francisco. And I've been trying to do some service ever since. And my current service, I'm with the GBC body, so <laughs> I don't know if that counts nowadays. And I'm um, happy to be here with all of you. I know it's pretty cold out there right now. <laughs> Okay, well, that was that brief enough? That that was too brief, but it is fine. You you can you can just go on now. Okay. So let me pull up the verse which I did have. Okay. So you said you sing Jai Radha Madhava first, and I don't have kartals, but um, actually quite often in the very, very long time ago, old days, we would use our hands as instruments. In other words, so I'll do the same now. Oh, no. 
Jaihom Sri Vishnupad Paramahansa Parabhata Kacharya Satara, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Sri Prabhupad Ki Jai, this Khan BBP founder Acharya's Divine Grace Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Kantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Hor Premanandi Hari Hari Bo, all glories, all glories, all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories, all glories, all glories to the lotus feet of Sri Guru and Sri Goranga. <clears throat> so, so, the um, verse today is from the Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth canto, 24th chapter. And it's the 40th verse. I generally do word by word and translation first and then the verse because that way you <clears throat> have some kind of an idea of what you're saying when you're chanting the verse. So I'll follow that format. So, Artha meaning, Lingaya revealing, Nabase unto the sky, Namha offering obeisances, Anta within, Bahi and without, Atmane unto the self. Namha, offering obeisances, punyaya, pious activities, lokaya, for creation, amushma, an, amushmai, beyond death, buri, varta, say the supreme <clears throat> effulgence. And please excuse my um, congested voice here. It's been this way for a few days. Arta lingaya nava se namo nantar bahirat mane namha punyaya lokaya usma iburi varta se Arta lingaya nava se namo nantar bahirat mane namha punyaya lokaya usma anu musma iburi varta se Translation by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. My dear Lord, by expanding your transcendental vibrations, you reveal the actual meaning of everything. You are the all-pervading sky within and without, and you are the ultimate goal of pious activities executable within this material world and beyond it. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto you. Or port again. Um, it would be good if everybody put themselves on mute because otherwise there's some background distraction noise. Purport. Vedic evidence is called Sabda Brahma. There are many things which are beyond the perception of our imperfect senses. Yet the authoritative evidence of sound vibration is perfect. The Vedas are known as Sabda Brahma because evidence taken from the Veda constitutes the ultimate understanding. This is because Sabda Brahma are the Vedas represent the Supreme Personality of Godhead. However, the real essence of Sabda Brahma is the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. By vibrating this transcendental sound, the meaning of everything, both material and spiritual, is revealed. <clears throat> this Hare Krishna is non different from the personality of Godhead. The meaning of everything is received through the air, through sound vibration. The vibration may be material or spiritual, but without sound vibration, no one can understand the meaning of anything. In the Vedas, it is said, Antar bahis cha tat sarvam vyapya vapya narayana shtita. Narayana is all pervading and he exists both within and without. And this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita 13:34, Ita prakasyati aka krishnam lokam imam ravi, shetram shetri tata krishnam 
Prakas Yati Bharata. O son of Bharata, as the sun alone illuminates all this universe, so do the living entity and the super soul illuminate the entire body by consciousness. In other words, the consciousness of both the soul and super soul is all pervading. And the limited consciousness of the living entity is pervading the entire material body. And the supreme consciousness of the Lord is pervading the entire universe. Because the soul is present within the body, consciousness pervades the entire body. Similarly, because the supreme soul, or Krishna, is present within this universe, <clears throat> everything is working in order. Maya dakshena prakriti sujate satchara this material nature is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, and it is producing all moving and unmoving beings. Bhagavad Gita 910. <clears throat> Lord Shiva is therefore praying to the personality of Godhead to be kind to us, so that simply by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we can understand everything in both the material and spiritual worlds. The word amushmai is significant in this regard because it indicates the best target one can aim for after attaining the higher planetary systems. Those who are engaged in fruit of activities, karmis, can attain the higher planetary system as a result of their past activities. And the jnanis who seek unification or a monastic merging with the effulgence of the Supreme Lord also attain their desired end. But in the ultimate issue, the devotees who desire to personally associate with the Lord are promoted to the Vaikuntha Lokas or Goloka Vrindavan. The Lord is described in Bhagavad Gita 10.12 as pavitrim pavitram paramam, the supreme pure. It is also confirmed in this verse. Sukadeva Goswami has stated that the cowherd boys who played with Lord Krishna are not ordinary individuals. Only after accumulating many pious activities in various births does one get the opportunity to personally associate with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, since only the pure can reach him. He is the Supreme poor, Pure. <clears throat> Again, translation. My dear Lord, by expanding your transcendental vibrations, you reveal the actual meaning of everything. You are the all-pervading sky within and without. And you are the ultimate goal of pious activities executed both within this material world and beyond it. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto you. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Veskatyude Satarine Sri Krishna Shetanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasari Gorbhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Vanja Kalpa Tarubhisha, Kripa Sindhu Vaivya Cha Pajitinam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namo Namaha Okay. 
So this portion here, the Rudra Gita, is Lord Shiva's song to the Supreme Lord Vasudev Vishnu. And it's known as the hymn of liberation. Now these prayers, which are contained in the Bhagavatam, specifically, um, it's coming over they from 33 to 74 of this, um, so we're kind of in the middle, uh, 424, 33 to 74. So this is the um, Rudra Gita. And it's presented by Lord Shiva to the sons of King Prasinibara. The sons are known collectively as the Pratetas. And he was presenting them to them for reaching the ultimate spiritual perfection. So the Supreme Lord Vishnu says, those who will offer me prayers composed by Lord Shiva, both in the morning and evening, will be given benediction by me. And in this way, they can both fulfill their desires and obtain good intelligence. So actually, that's um, a verse coming up in the 30th, uh, 4, 24, 30. Um, so before starting, I just wanted to mention a few words about Chaitanya Jivan, whose um, passage was celebrated in a memorial service um, yesterday. And um, it was quite the, the theme of the ones who were speaking were basically on his humility. It was practically mentioned by everyone, along with his caring nature towards all and the effort to um, offer Krishna consciousness to his yoga students, be a prasad in the Bhagavad Gita, in which to speak of his um, dedicated involvement with Rathyatra, spurred on by his love for Jagannath. So his final Rathyatra in this lifetime was recently in San Juan, which was San Juan, Puerto Rico, which has already passed, and it was held on Christmas Day. He walked for some time. I had the I was also there and he walked for some time and um, and he sat the entire, um, sat by the stage for the entire program. And then as we began to depart, he, request, he requested Jai Sita uh, to stop the van. He got out and he walked over to their lordships and offered them his final prostrated obeisances on the sidewalk. And on his departure was a very large image of Sri Baladev was placed in his room in front of him, along with Srila Prabhupada and Lord Nisringadev, which held his attention and were the objects of his loving last darshan and his last breath. So, and then just this morning, I um, saw on Facebook that His Grace Bali Maharaj has entered into hospice, and I want to offer my um, respectful and affectionate obeisances to His Grace Bali Maharaj, and may the cows of Gita Nagari accompany him to his next destination. So, I had looked up the Subda Brahma. Just you know, here is such a fully complete explanation. Subda Brahma. I was thinking, I wonder if there's anything else to be said. And when I looked it up, um, actually, the, this was what was quoted, the uh, statements here in the purport. Um, and I remember Srila Prabhupada speaking Sabda Brahma. And um, of course, we didn't know what that meant. But then he explained that it was the... Um, universal sound vibration through which we could understand everything and that meant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And I remember him telling us that when you, because the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra was a transcendental sound vibration, it's, it wasn't a vibration that came from this world, that as soon as it was uttered, it would encircle the whole entire universe. And in an, I, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but it was a really incredibly fast amount of time. The vibration would circle the entire universe. And therefore, um, you know, the importance and the value 
of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and, and specifically in the age of Kali, the um, importance of Harnam Sankirtan, the congregational chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is of the utmost importance because if we can just chant enough and induce others to chant enough, more and more chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, actually there is a opportunity to make a change in this world. <clears throat> In this um, section, this chapter, there was many um, things that were being discussed in, with, throughout the, um, the, the chapter coming up to the 40th verse. And some of the interesting things was that it was to be understood that when the demigods fall down, they come to earth as the sons of very rich and pious families. And when they're in such families, then they get the opportunity to execute Krishna consciousness, which in turn allows them to be promoted to the desired goal back home, back to Godhead. I was just thinking, you know, sometimes we don't know who the people next to us are. And yet we understand through this statement, this is in one of the purports that, um, the demigods fall down if they do, when they do, and it becomes sons of very rich and pious families. So then I was realizing there's a lot of very special people in this movement. Um, sometimes people take perverted pleasure in criticizing ISKCON, but actually Srila Prabhupada opened the gates for the demigods to have a place to land when they fall down. And of course, this um, this kirtan yagya, devotional service, <clears throat> is the one way which everyone can very easily be elevated to the supreme planet where the supreme Lord resides. And in this day and age, it's not possible to follow the other yagyas as in, pre in former yugyas. <laughs> yugas, just like Maharaj Rahishat performed this intense yaga, but we can't do that. But it's within our means to perform Harinam Sankirtan. And Prabhupada pointed out, it doesn't cost anything. You can sit down anywhere and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And if the surface of the globe is over flooded with the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, then Prabhupada said in a very clear statement, the people of the world will be very, very happy. <clears throat> and on the other hand, in the Sage of Kali, if people do not take advantage of chanting Hare Krishna mantra, which is actually a concession for the fallen humans of this age, then it's to be understood that such a person is very much bewildered by the illusory energy. And this also means that ourselves as devotees of the Lord, as members of Srila Prabhupada's movement, have a incumbent duty given to us. It's, it's, it's a standalone order to spread this Krishna consciousness, particularly the Hare Krishna mantra through the um, congregational chanting of the holy name. So <clears throat> sometimes people think, oh, they need to have a direct order. But Srila Prabhupada has given this order to spread the Krishna consciousness movement. So that's a personal order to each and one of every one of us for all times. So if another point that was, if one is supposed to be um, perfect, so one is supposed to be perfect when one is perfectly religious, perfect in the execution of one's own vows to, rip, to render devotional service, and then perfect in the knowledge, and perfect in good behavior, and so on. So this kind of was um, the definition of perfection. And then how do we get there? So after being initiated and receiving the orders of the spiritual master, a disciple should unhesitatingly think about the instructions or the orders of the spiritual master and shouldn't allow ourselves to be disturbed by anything else. And Prabhupada noted, this is the secret of success. This disciple should not consider whether he's going back home, back to Godhead. 
his first business should be to execute the order of the, his spiritual master. And this way, a disciple should always meditate on the order of the spiritual master. And that is perfectional meditation. And then not only should you meditate on the order, but then you have to find out the means and the ways by which we can perfectly worship and execute it. So we know Srila Prabhupada um, received a direct order from his spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, upon the occasion of his first meeting. And he went there to meet Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, not on his own accord, but just to satisfy a friend of his. In fact, at first, when his friend asked him to come, he said, no, he wasn't interested. Because like a lot of us, he had met other so-called sadhus, and he wasn't so impressed by their behavior. Many of us had that experience prior to coming to Krishna consciousness. So he almost became disinterested. And uh, Srila Prabhupada also, he wasn't so interested. And then he came in, he was making his obeisances because, you know, he was respectful. He was brought up that way. He made his obeisances. Yeah. And immediately he was giving this order. You are an educated young man, you know. Mm-hmm. You should take this message and, 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 and preach. Take it to the West. And uh, it was interesting because here he's getting a direct order from his spiritual master or his, that moment, not quite, but um, he gets this order and he goes, well, because he was at that point a follower of Gandhi who was promoting peace. And peace through disassociation from the British. In other words, and the, the British were dominating uh, India at the time. So he, Sri Prabhupada said, well, nobody's going to listen to somebody that comes from a country where you're being dominated by, you know, another, another country. And Sri Bhakti Siddhanta came right back and said that this process, this Krishna consciousness is so perfect, it has nothing to do with any mundane situation or politics. And Sri Prabhupada commented to us, he said, generally among my peers, among my friends, I was always a leader. And if there was a debate, I would win it. For the first time, I was defeated. And I liked it very much. And then later he said, actually, it was at this first meeting that he accepted Shri Bhakti Siddhanta in his heart as his spiritual master. <clears throat> so there is spiritual significance only after one accepts the guru and accepts the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. And of course, the culmination is surrender into the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So... It's the duty of the father, the spiritual master, the king to regulate their subordinates. Of course, we don't like this word subordinate so much nowadays, but um, if we're not, if we don't understand that we're subordinate to the spiritual master, to the father, and ultimately the supreme lord, um, then we're not going to make advancement. So it's the duty of the father, the spiritual master, and the king or in our case, um, you know, we have presidents, we have whatever, and help them to become unalloyed devotees of Krishna. And it's the duty of the superiors to um, do this, and it's the duty of the subordinates to obey the orders perfectly and in a disciplined way. And that's because the disciples of a devotee have taken a shelter, taken shelter. When you take shelter of a great soul, um, Prabhupada explained, you become calm and quiet. And you're not agitated by the waves of the material world. So um, the material world, it's often described as a great ocean of nescience. You know? So in such an ocean, everything is agitated. But when you get a deep, deep ocean, then the agitation's only on the top. And if you go deeper, then it's very, very peaceful. So the um, mind of a devotee, of a great devotee, is compared to an ocean or a very large lake. 
but there's no agitation because the devotee is always deeply absorbed in Krishna. And actually, devotees obtain the perfection of the Satchitananda, this eternity, bliss, and knowledge, because um, the impersonalists deny the various varieties of creation. They don't really enjoy transcendental bliss, bliss. but devoid, devotees of Krishna, they fully attain perfection of this eternity, bliss, and knowledge. And the impersonalists are generally the worshipers of Lord Shiva, whose beautiful songs are going to make up the bulk of this um, chapter. So Shiva is no, but on the other hand, even though the impersonals are worshiping Shiva, Shiva is never without variety in his abode. So wherever one goes, whether to the planet of Shiva, Lord Vishnu or Lord Brahma, there's varieties to be enjoyed by persons in full knowledge and bliss. And the devotees of, of Vishnu are not hankering after material benedictions. And Lord Vishnu doesn't give his devotees benedictions that would cause disturbance to the whole world. You know, we have so many examples where um, that devotees, some the persons, generally persons of a more assured nature, but they would come to Lord Brahma for some kind of benediction. Of course, the classic example, Harani Kashipu, he got the benediction, but such a disturbance. And then Rikta Shura, who went to Shiva, got a benediction, whoever he touched the head would fall off. And of course, we know how that turned out, not so good, because Shiva being a person who tastes Shiva like anything. And uh, Shiva goes to the Lord for shelter. And then, you know, they got Rikha Shura like, how do we know that actually is going to work? You know, that Shiva, he's not really to be relied upon. So test it out, touch your head and see what happens. And of course, we know what happened. He lost his head. So Krishna, our, Vic, our Krishna, <coughs> Vishnu is known as Bhaktivatsala, friend of all. And Lord Shiva is Dharma Vatsala which is referring to a person who lives according to religious principles. So to unfold the mystery of bhakti yoga is the ultimate stage in all inquiries are the highest objective for the inquisitive personality. Everyone is searching after self-realization, but in different ways, like karma yoga, jnana yoga, jnana yoga, raja yoga, and bhakti yoga. But to engage in self-realization is the responsibility of every living entity developed in consciousness. And bhakti yoga is the means to actually bring success. So, <clears throat> many uh, great leaders, so-called great leaders in our human society are ignorant of this knowledge of bhakti. And they're always engaged in what Prabhupada calls ignoble acts of sense gratification describing them as bewildered by the external energy of the Lord. And he goes further, they are stubborn rebels against the supremacy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And <laughs> I mean, Prabhupada so beautifully speaks the truth in, in, in very clear, concise words. Although sometimes we hesitate to mention these words in the way Prabhupada does. So he's saying that these materialists are stubborn fools against the, um, the rebelling, stubborn rebels against the supremacy of the Lord. And then he goes on, they'll never surrender into him because they're fools, miscreants, and the lowest of human beings. And if that's not enough, he mentions that the faithless, these faithless non-believers may be highly educated in the material sense of the term, but factually, they're the greatest fools of the world because of the influence of the external material nature. All of their so-called acquisition of knowledge has been made null and void. So when Prabhupada um, makes these powerful statements, he, he's not acting out of false ego. He's, he's, he's just speaking factually. Like if you look out your window, 
Um, maybe you're going to see some snow on the ground. So he said, there's snow on the ground. If I look out my window right now, it's still dark. So he said, it's still dark outside. You know, it's, it's not a judgmental statement. He's just, as we used to say, telling it like it is. So therefore, the um, all advancement of knowledge in the present context of things is being misused. And again, probably says, it's by cats and dogs fighting with one another for sense gratification. And all acquisition of knowledge and science, philosophy, fine arts, nationalism, economic development, religion, and great activities are being spoiled by being used as dresses for dead men. Now, that is a very succinct statement. And when you think about it, this is um, Fourth Canto, um, translated after he came to America. And uh, so he's seen a little bit of how things are going in the Western world by this time. So it brings an even more powerful, it makes it an even more powerful statement of how he's describing um, the, the condition of the material world. And uh, all these activities are being spoiled by being used as dresses for dead men. And after that, he goes, there's no utility and the dresses for covering up a coffin of a dead body, save getting false applause from the ignorant public. So, you know, we, we, we should try to understand this in such a way that we may not be able to go around speaking in such direct terminology, but we should understand it and be able to present it in such a way that the point gets across because otherwise people just think everything's fine and and it's not fine um we can see it ourselves how how much degradation is just swiftly enveloping this planet and all around our lives we're just seeing this um disintegrate i mean people are making all wonderful buildings and new highways and fancy this and that and having their olympics but it's just symptoms of a degraded society and the liberty of discharging um, <clears throat> the liberty of discharging transcendental loving service to the lord anyone can engage in this it's, it's invested in everyone even living beings born in sinful um, conditions in um, the second canto in the ninth it's during the chapter sloki so that's stated there that the liberty of discharging loving transcendental service to the Lord is invested in everyone. <clears throat> Even the women, the sutras, the forest tribes, or any living being in sinful conditions. So in other words, there's always hope on the horizon when one is engaged in Krishna consciousness. And one who engages in Krishna consciousness and tries to give the same a message to others becomes very, very dear to the Lord. <clears throat> because as long as one is fully absorbed in material activities, then our minds become overwhelmed in this whirlpool of matter. And then we just keep going on in cage in material bodies, life after life, without any recollection of knowledge of our unfortunate condition. <clears throat> Now, this whole matter of life is explained by the Lord himself. This is the Bhagavatam. It's a, you could say, a blueprint for life, how to live life. And it's explained by the Lord himself. And for one who doesn't have any approach to the Lord in his personal feature, they can rarely understand the purports of the Bhagavatam. In fact, the need, like anybody can read the Bhagavatam, and we're distributing it. Um, this year, in fact, during the um, the marathon, there was a record number of Bhagavatam sets. I don't remember the number, but it was impressive being, you know, distributed. And uh, at the same time, one can rarely understand the Lord in his personal feature, even after reading the Bhagavatam, without being taught by the Bhagavatas, means the devotees, Bhagavata, those who are connected with Krishna and who are in the authorized disciplic succession. So again, each and every one of us, we have a um, standing order to help 
the world who was in such mysterious um, decline to help the world by teaching them about Krishna because we are in the authorized disciplic succession and we have heard from a pure devotee. Bilba Mangala Thakur says if one has unalloyed devotion for the Supreme Lord, the goddess of liberation is ready to serve him as well as all the God's material opulence. And the demigods are standing in line waiting for an opportunity to serve the devotees. We have such a, um, I mean, devotees are exalted. Even, even fallen devotees are exalted. That was also being mentioned earlier in this verse, in this chapter with regards to Lord Indra. That he was behaving in a way that's not normally con, you know, condoned. And yet he was excused. Uh, there's no need for a devotee of Krishna to endeavor for material opulences or liberation just by being situated in a transcendental position of devotional service. The devotee receives all the benefits of this dharma, artha, karma, and moksha. And the moksha, this is liberation, different types of liberation, but the moksha normally is avoided by devotees except for the moksha of devotional service, which is the ultimate liberation. <clears throat> and one of the glories of Lord Shiva um, it is not so much seen by common men, but in the same way as a person who is um, fully surrendered unto, um, a person is fully surrendered unto Vasudev of Krishna, those persons are also rarely seen because a person who's fully surrendered unto Krishna, the Supreme Lord, is very, very rare. We understand this from the Bhagavad Gita. Sa Mahatma Dulabaha. So consequently, when Lord Shiva came, especially to see the Prachetas, he came because they were fully surrendered into the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the conclusion then is that a devotee of Lord Shiva is not so dear to Lord Shiva. But a devotee of Lord Krishna is very dear to Lord Shiva. So these, um, no one should think that the um, prayers recited by Lord Shiva as being sectarian. Rather, they're very confidential. So much so that anyone desiring the ultimate prosperity or the auspicious goal of life must take these instructions of Shiva and pray to and glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Lord Shiva himself did. And it's, it's explained that when a mantra, when a mantra is chanted by a great devotee, the mantra becomes more powerful. Although the Hare Krishna mantra, it is powerful in itself, a disciple upon initiation receives a mantra from his spiritual master. And when the mantra is chanted by the spiritual master, it becomes even more powerful. So one should remain a fixed devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as explained by Shiva, and not desire to merge into the existence of the Supreme Lord by, like the impersonalist. Rather, one should just think that it's such good fortune to be able to continue to be fixed in the understanding of the Lord as his servant. And this understanding, by this understanding, one um, realizes that all living beings, including Shiva, our Brahma, and other demigods, are all servants of the Supreme Lord. So any conditioned soul within this material universe can ultimately achieve perfection when he's under the protection of Vasudev, or when he's engaged in devotional service. And this is the mood of Lord Shiva, who is the um, best of all Vaishnavas, and he wants others also to become pure unalloyed devotees of Lord Krishna. And that is his teaching, and that is his message to all of us. So then, okay, now I'm seeing time is 5.49. So I got permission to go a little over time. I'll try to not go too much over time. But um, you, can take, you can take questions if you want. Okay. I was going to say, if you just say a couple words about Srila Prabhupada. 
Okay. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I was going to actually I have a couple of things to ask you about Chile Prabhupada, but you go ahead and please take questions and say whatever you want. Okay. Well, I'm trying to, there's so many things in them. I think, okay, what should I say? Anyways, um, can I can I veer you in a particular direction? Do you mind? Okay, you can. Um, I had something in mind. Go ahead. Well, if you had something in mind, go ahead. But otherwise, I wanted to know if you ever. I mean, because you had such close association with Prabhupada, and Prabhupada will actually give. This was very rare in the early early days. He will give direct instructions to his associates, you among them. So, did he ever? ask you to do something and you thought, no, that's not possible. I can't do that. I... <laughs> Never. That was, you know, nowadays they use that word empowerment a lot. Mm -hmm. Sri Prabhupada was the supreme empowerer. Because of our affection for him and because of our complete faith in him, if he asked us to do something, whatever it was, yes, it didn't we didn't stop to consider or evaluate the likelihood of what he was asking us to do to possibly not be possible. Yes, we'll do it. I'll give you a personal example. I was 22 and, um, you know, my husband, Shum Sundar, so he was just under 25. And there was a young woman, a young girl. She was a girl. She was 16 years old. And her brother, was already initiated. His name was Krishna Das. And this girl, her name was Sarah. And she'd had a pretty rough beginning in life. The mother, when she found out she was pregnant, she didn't want this girl. But fortunately, she didn't try for an abortion. What she did do was after she gave birth, she walked out of the hospital just leaving the newborn baby there. So that was her start. And then the social services it was in California. And in California, they like to, at least they used to, like to keep families together. So got the family back together. But the mother was like, she would keep this girl out of school and, and force her to go out and shoplift. Like, you know, what kind of mother is this? And the result was her grades were terrible because she had so many absentees. And um, <clears throat> so she saw the Bhagavad Gita was that first Macmillan edition that her brother had, and she became uh, attracted. And she wanted to find out more <clears throat> about, um, you know, how to get away from the mother, to go to the temple. But occasionally she would be able to do that. And um, at the same time, she wasn't very often able to do it. So Krishna Das asked Srila Prabhupada during the darshan, he goes, is there something we can do to help my sister? So Prabhupada goes, hmm, well, perhaps Shamsundra and Malati can adopt her. Now, what would you think? She's like 16, I'm 22 years old, he's 24, we're going to adopt this girl? Um, all right. I didn't think of that at all. Next day, I was down to City Hall. I found out what, so it wasn't an exact adoption, but we were getting, I went for full custody, found out how to do it, filled out the forms. We got a, a, a court date, the mother, the daughter, Sarah, and the father, myself, my husband, we all had to appear before the judge. It was a family court. And one by one, she took us into her chambers, and then she came out. She goes, well, this may seem a little strange. The mother is 22 and the daughter is 16, but I give full custody to this couple. And she goes, you know, hits the, the desk with her gavel, you know. Um, so that's just one example. Well, to speak of when he asked Shem Sundar to carve Lord Jagannath, of course, Shem Sundar, he liked working with wood, but he, not, he hadn't really done any like wood carving, like a sculpture type of thing. But yes. Immediately, yes. And because of the desire to please Srila Prabhupada, the empowerment was there. Um, there's so many, I mean, the whole Krishna consciousness movement is practically an example of that. When you just think about our humble origin, you know, our, our humble um, beginning, 
starting under a, a tree in Tompkins Square Park. I mean, that's where it started. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we're asked what is, inspires us to remain in Krishna consciousness in spite of so many hardships or adverse conditions sometimes, but there's only one honest answer. It's Krishna consciousness itself and Srila Prabhupada who are the inspiration. It's nothing else. And nowadays, sometimes Krishna consciousness is diluted with a variety of other um, topics, kind of like a mixed cocktail of Ayurveda, yoga, astrology, feel-good sayings without mentioning God or Krishna, presented in some kind of new age, make you feel good concoction that really don't offer something substantial. Well, to speak of something that you would give your life to. But Srila Prabhupada, he was not an ordinary person. He was not a ordinary spiritual master. And in his presence, by his example, by his words, which he was living, we were empowered. Srila Prabhupada was unique. And that's his signature of Srila Prabhupada. He was and he remains unique until this day. And how was this? He was not an ordinary man. Oh. And this has been confirmed by his actions, his followers, been confirmed by learned scholars and Vedantas, as well as all respectable Gaudiya Vaishnavas. So this is Srila Prabhupada, and we would do well to consider this point. And he was and remains to this day unique. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, are there any embarrassing moments of your, when you served Prabhupada and you were, uh, you, you messed that up? The, some blunders that we can hear <laughs> about. Oh, God. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I can start right in the beginning. There was this little transcendental competition between the, the New York devotees and the San Francisco devotees, because the New York devotees felt he's ours, and they didn't like the fact that he went out with those heathen hippies in San Francisco. And um, there would just be these funny little back and forth exchanges. And um, like one time, they would always send stuff to him. And they would, in those days, you could do this. It would be sent collect. It meant we had to pay from our end. And most of the time, nothing too like shocking. Um, but one time, it was like a really heavy thing. And um, it was kind of broken open. So I opened up and it was like a red brick. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> a red brick. <laughs> it was just, you know, so I didn't give it to him. And then oh, a few days later, you know, he asked me, did anything come from New York? I go, yeah, yes. He goes, what? And I said, a red brick. <laughs> he goes, bring it. I've been waiting. Like, what, what is this? So what is this? It was the, um, it wasn't an ordinary brick, as if anything associated with Shuddha Prabhupada would be ordinary. It was a um, natural dye, and it's what he used to dye his cloth, the saffron color. And... Um, I mean, that's just one example. Um, but one thing was funny. So, you know, we were thinking when, when Shamsundar carved the first set of juggernauts for San Francisco, then Prabhupada asked them to carve for New York City. So we did it, but we didn't tell them. And the first one, Lord Juggernaut, was sent in mail, collect. You know, without we get back at them, so we had all these um, garlands and flowers. Not thinking about the fact, by the time they got to New York, they might be a little funky, which they were. So they, you know, they opened it up, and the devotees told me later, they, were, what is this? All oh, those San Francisco devotees, you know. Um, and another really, and I, probably the most embarrassing. I mean, at least for me, probably there's other ones if I think about it. But I was this cook in various occasions, one being in Mayapur, and um, was trying really hard to always please him. But this was like the early days before we had anything. So we're living in tents. There was one source of water, uh, one of these water pumps and no drainage. So I had this, you know, big pool of mud around it. 
everything was just really pretty difficult. And uh, there was no proper kitchen or facility. It was just outside the little bhajan kutir um, cooking out, right out in the open. And um, every day I'd bring to him and he'd like notice some little thing. And, you know, because I was thinking how to please him, how to make it perfect. So um, he'd find some little thing maybe that could be a little better and he'd let me know about it. And one day I had made this preparation and I was thinking, I think I got it today, little pride crept in. So I'm like, I bring it in, I offer it to him and he um, takes a spoon and he looks, he goes, what is this? You're feeding me worm? And at the most bizarre thing, I had cut this um, eggplant into very small little pieces. And somehow or other, in one of those very small little pieces, a little worm was hidden and didn't get exposed. But of course, in the heat, it came out, you know, in the cooking. And that was the first thing Srila Prabhupada picked up. So that was, at least for me, embarrassing and a little humiliating. <laughs> Any of the devotees have any questions? They can either write them on the chat to everyone or unmute themselves and ask. Yes, Queenie. Krishna what a melody. Please accept my humble obeisance. <laughs> oh, glory to Sri but Thank you for spending time with us today. And um, I was meditating during your class because we was you were also talking about the spiritual master. And um, now that I have heard, sometimes they say that uh, because Sri Prabhupada is a pure devotee, but um, Sri Prabhupada Sri Prabhupada disciples may not be a pure devotee, although they are spiritual master. And so how do we develop that faith in the spiritual master as um, you do, as you do with Sri Prabhupada? So I will tell you a story about Sri Prabhupada and his disciples and pure devotee. This was like in very early 68, maybe January, February. And um, there weren't so many of us at that point in time. So devotees was going on a walk with Jiva Prabhupada in San Francisco. And uh, one of the, it was a bhakta to Tom, and he turns to Prabhupada and he goes, at that time we were calling him Swamiji. He goes, so are there any other pure devotees in the world like you? Are there any other pure devotees? And Prabhupada turns to the person. So Tom was on his left and he turns to the person. Prabhupada turns to the person on his right, who is Upendra. So how many of us are there? <laughs> and Upendra comes oh, 34, no, 34, 35, 40. There weren't so many of us, you know. So then Prabhupada turns to Bhakti Tom, who's questioned again, how, are there any pure devotees? He goes, about 34, 35. So suddenly we're all thinking, my God, we're pure devotees. <laughs> you know? um, however, there's some quali qualifications and levels of pure devotee, which we quickly realize soon afterwards. So just let's take an example. You've got your preschool. You've got your kindergarten. You've got your elementary school. You've got your middle school. You've got your college or your high school, your college. You have your postgraduate, et cetera, et cetera, right up to PhD. Now the preschooler and the PhD, both are students, but are, on, are they on the same level? So Prabhupada said that any he qualified as pure devotee. Anyone who serves the spiritual master's order is a pure devotee. But then again, there's levels. But we have to be respectful to anyone who is serving the spiritual master, anyone who is chanting Hare Krishna. And sometimes in our 
disease state, it's a stretch of the imagination. What? How can this person even be called a devotee? We have these subtle impurities in our mind. But if you go back to the first um, beginning of this um, chapter, you've got that example of Lord Shiva, I mean, Lord um, Indra, who was um, misbehaving. And yet, um, he was, it was overlooked. It was overlooked by the king who had a higher vision of things. And of course, there's always the verse which sometimes gets thrown around um, correctly and incorrectly that whatever, you know, that one is <clears throat> one who is serving Krishna is always to be considered as a perfect person, even if they may do something accidentally in the course of life, if, you know. But that verse is not to be used to be taken advantage of. Like, okay, you know, I can do this and that, but it's going to be okay. I'm a devotee, I'm chanting. But if one is accidentally in the course of executing devotional service, commits an un, un, unplanned error, then that can be overlooked. And they can still be considered a pure devotee. I have, a, I have a question now that we have our dear Bali Maharaj on the process of leaving his body. Um, when Prabhupada, well, it was probably very difficult and kind of surprising to most devotees because they thought Prabhupada would be there forever. And he, will, he will never leave you. And, and he hasn't. Well, it, yes, in his... I understand your point. <laughs> so, but uh, there were people like Jamuna who understood about service and separation. So she, she began the process way before Prabhupada left the planet. So how, this, how did you prepare? How did this affect you? Did you, did you have such a realization like Jamuna's? Did you prepare for Prabhupada's departure? Uh, or you didn't, and how did Prabhupada's physical departure affect you? What happened to you? I probably won't tell that in full. It wasn't as if there was, um, I mean, Jamuna was an extraordinary soul. And uh, just the example you gave is proof of it, um, her preparedness. On the other hand, there were people like myself who felt that by remaining, by, by serving Prabhupada, by um, following his instructions, and that that would keep us with Prabhupada, even in his absence. Because from the very beginning, I mean, June, July 17th, 1967, um, Maybe it was just a little somewhat before that, a few days before that. Get the chronological order. No, 17th was um, Rathiatra. So a few days after that, Rathiatra. It was first Rathiatra. And Srila Prabhupada was in the West Coast. But he was over across the um, Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County because he wasn't well. And we got him a little place on Stinson Beach for recovery. And because of the winding, winding roads, it would kind of cause him to not feel even, it, he would cause him to feel even worse. So he didn't come to the Rathiatra. He was too weak. And um, he wasn't finding himself recovering as optimum as he would have expected. So he made a decision and he let the devotees know he wanted to come to San Francisco and he had something to tell us. So on that day, we were sitting around him and um, he, he was, I mean, he always sat very erect. And that was, no matter how he would feel, I mean, I, I could go on on stories on this, like he was so sick that when one time in, in Mayapur, they had to carry him up on this little stage where he insisted he wanted to go because he promised a person and the devotee said, no, no, well, we'll go for you. And he said, no, I said I would go. I had to carry him on the stage, you know, prop him on this chair. And he slumped over. 
And when he began to speak, suddenly it was erect. It was as, as if there was another person in his body and forcefully speaking. And as soon as it was done, so he had that, you know, preaching was his life and soul. Giving Krishna was his life and soul. But he was sitting very erect. And uh, the announcement was, he told us he had decided to go back to India to recover. And, <clears throat> and then he gave us an instruction. He said, I want you boys and girls to carry on this movement. And that was slightly shocking in some degree because um, for the most part, we weren't considering we were part of a movement of two small storefronts, you know, <coughs> uh, New York, San Francisco. And um, he says, I'm an old man. I may die at any time. Now, we'd heard that mantra, birth, death, disease, and old age from day one. But suddenly, he was saying, I'm an old man. I may die at any time. Well, first of all, okay, he was definitely older than us. But we never, ever thought of him like an old man, like, you know, our parents or other elderly persons. Um, and that he would die. It just was incomprehensible. And that we're supposed to push on this movement and we very... I mean, it was like a wake up. We're in a movement. I mean, it was just like this family feeling. You know, we were this family, this tight little family, the family in New York, the family in San Francisco. But we're part of a movement and we have to push it on. And how are we going to do this? Yeah. That was a very intense moment. moment. And how, what did that have to do with us being connected with Srila Prabhupada in the future after his departure? Because by following that instruction, as limited as we were, that connection was being established. Srila Prabhupada was once asked how he felt in the absence of a spiritual master, in the separation of a spiritual master. And he said, I'm never separated from my spiritual master. He's with me. I'm always with him. So that was <clears throat> there, even if there was not an immediate comprehension, but we had a glimpse of the goal. And for myself personally, it was well after his departure that that became a reality for me. It wasn't immediate. Um, there were some twists and turns in my life, some of you know that, but at a later date, it was firmly established and Prabhupada's presence is part of my life irrevocably. And I think that it's probably the same for many, many, many of his disciples and many of you also, following his instructions. Thank you, Malati, for being so candid and uh, talking to us. There is a, we have a question from a, one of our cows, Malava Sevika. We, we, have, we have a camera and a microphone in the, in the cow shed. So one of the cows has a, has a question for you. It doesn't look like a cow, but it's a cow. Can I say something here? Yes. Because there was a certain point um, back in the day, <laughs> like early, early, the men started referring to the women as cows. <laughs> so Prabhupada, he, he didn't appreciate it. And he chastised them. He said, these are not ordinary women. These women are devotees. Anyway, so, okay, the question. Hare Krishna Mahalati Prabhu. Thank you so much uh, for you? that. Hare Krishna. <laughs> My name is Agari Krishna Das, not Madhav Devika. Um, so my question relates to what you're mentioning just now about um, um, just carrying on proper mission as your life and soul and that manifesting later on in your life coupled with, and it relates to um, 
the struggle of staffing health admission on farms. Uh, so as you very well know, help uh, wants um, us to establish uh, farms and protect cows. But like here at Gidanagri, it's such a struggle uh, for devotees to like stay. It's also a struggle uh, in Newfoundland and probably right. every other community. <laughs> right, right. So, and you very, you're more experienced uh, in terms of knowing that fact. So my question relates to you, uh, yeah, you Prabhupada disciples early on, you mentioned that you were able to take on whatever Prabhupada asked uh, very quickly and you didn't consider that you wouldn't be able to do it. But us second generation, third generation devotees were a bit more cerebral and particularly with staying on a farm, it's a very cerebral thing. Um, so, so how do we, yeah, just be patient, develop patience in, and, and devotees who have been able to stay on and serve the cows, how do we transmit that to new devotees who are looking towards serving uh, in this cow protection mission, but it's a struggle. So in other words, how do we say to them that, look, okay, even prophet disciples like yourself, you had to be patient with yourself. And you could, there's some aspects after Prabhupada's departure, you weren't, it didn't manifest immediately, but there were other services which Prabhupada asked you and you were able to do it immediately. Um, so with us, uh, third generation, we have the luxury of immediacy with pretty much everything in terms of due to technology. But it seems like being able to stay on and serve cows, like we're changing varnas, you know, from a corporate sudra like myself, just sitting behind the desk to trying to become a Vaisha, it's like we're changing bodies. Uh, so it's not going to happen overnight. So how do we develop more patience and try to impart it to those that are very interested in serving in this mission? Hare Krishna. I probably wouldn't, I don't think I'm qualified even to answer this, but I'll just give you my thoughts as I've heard from Prabhupada. And just one thing, you said you're trying to become a Vaisha. I'd stop, I'd just forget trying to become a Vaisha and just become a devotee. You're already a devotee, just work on that. And you just happen to be that you're a cowherd devotee or something to that effect. One time, um, some parents came to meet Srila Prabhupada. Their goal was to get their son back. And um, it became obvious that that probably wasn't going to happen. And it was a, a farm community. So they go, you know, if everybody's always chanting Hare Krishna. They said it a little sarcastically. Everybody's chanting Hare Krishna. Who will melt the cows? Prabhupada just gave that huge smile. He goes, we will melt the cows. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Anyways, there's three things that are always incumbent upon every endeavor, even material endeavors. What to speak of a spiritual endeavor? And that is determination, enthusiasm, and patience. So you were mentioning the patience part, but there also has to be enthusiasm and determination. And that sometimes is a little, um, or it feels like it's lacking. But Prabhupada said, if anyone, in the, if anyone of those three is absent, then your endeavor, whatever it is, will not be successful. So we just have to do a little, you know, internal check. And then people sometimes, oh, how do I get enthusiasm? And how do we get anything? We work on it. We go after it. It may not be an overnight explosion, but when we talk of struggles, I mean, you, I think, are maybe referring to the actual physical struggles, maybe, that are coming out of, as a result of being in a rural community when you were not maybe you didn't grow up in a rural community so you know this is like kind of a um game changer for you um and then there's our internal personal struggles of the two the internal struggles are the most difficult to confront but we must do it and how do we do that with determination and if we 
just even we have to fake a little enthusiasm <laughs> you know like okay i'm at my daughter's house in arizona so last night um for an hour or so we watched this olympics thing so i was observing the the way the be these people were acting and it was um like showing the opening ceremonies and so there's all these people there and it's just bloody cold it's terribly cold and then there's the whole COVID thing and the whole stand you know there's this huge stadium full of empty seats because you can't it's not really very enlivening and then there's these tensions between different countries and they're all together there but I was noticing there's so there was this around the whole stadium there were these people and they were just jumping up and down like this like, why? You know, trying to create some enthusiasm and I was thinking yes that's it we just gotta fake it because I mean I'm sure they weren't that enthusiastic under the circumstance but Prabhupada's you know the classic example when Gargamuni um, <clears throat> was told by Prabhupada when you enter and leave the room of the spiritual master well you should make obeisances and he goes well I'll do it when I feel like it Prabhupada's reply do it and then you'll feel like it <laughs> just something to think about thank you so much Hare Krishna. just a follow up on that particular question how do you how do you manage? Are you? Is there a point where enthusiasm, patience, and determination are second nature? Is this a muscle memory? How, what's what's your what's your secret? I shut the door behind me. I don't have anywhere else to go, so I might as well. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. Um, I mean, even trying to imagine a life outside of Krishna consciousness, and I tried it. Horrifying so but you don't want to let fear be the only motivation so keep at it and then there's a switch it just happens it may happen quickly or it just may be the course of time and suddenly it's just there and you just want to be there wherever you are however you are serving krishna serving Prabhupada, serving the devotees anything you want to ask Malati Prabhu. We went through this Prabhu thing that um, I asked Malati about if Prabhupada ever called the women Prabhu. If this is, this was, uh, and uh, Malati sent me a whole paper of Prabhupada. Quite enlivening, actually, that yes, women, not only women, but uh, you quoted a letter from Lila Shakti sent to you that she heard. Prabhupada addressed you with little Saraswati in your hands, a toddler. My arm, she's still a baby. <laughs> a baby. So uh, Prabhupada called call you Malati Prabhu and Saraswati Prabhu, who wasn't even able to form her first sentence, and she was already a Prabhu. So this is... Uh, on the occasion of her initiation slash marriage, uh, Shakadevi Dasi, known as Jean because she wasn't a married, you know, hadn't had. So this was in Vrindavan and Prabhupada's, he, he looks like, a, so where is Jean Prabhu? She hasn't entered yet. So where is Jean Prabhu? It was just second nature to us. And it was so sweet because we just saw everybody, Prabhupada as Prabhu, everybody. It wasn't man Prabhu, female Prabhu, it was Prabhu. It wasn't like, oh, Prabhu is a male masculine term. I mean, that's some of the stuff that gets thrown out. Prabhupada was so brilliant. He just took away the bodily covering. When we addressed each other like that, we felt it. So it was a very sweet type of um, mood as a result. The problem is if you feel yourself a uh, Prabhu. That, yes. yes. That, that is an inconvenience. Yes, he gave that instruction. Not, he says you address each other as Prabhu, not that you become Prabhu. That was the instruction. Even the same, uh, the same principle is applied towards bhakta, bhakta this, bhakta that. Bhakta means actually pure devotee. So it's, it's not like you're, you're, you have to make it out of that in order to make advancement. It, they already gave you the title. Uh, also, Prabhupada gave Brahman threads to people, and, and this is Brahminical initiation. But he said, 
now grow within it, become a Brahman. This is not like this. This is a certification that you are a Brahman. This is this is an in, uh, inducement and uh, to be enthused about becoming one. Now, now you have a yeah. <laughs> an object to to appeal that will show your status. But now you have to achieve it on your own merit. Yeah, like initiation wasn't you, that you've accomplished something. You took the first step, and now you're beginning to do something. So you said you got initiated two days after being in the movement for two days? Um, it's pretty quick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a waiting period. It was just a short one. Um, it was very short. But, you know, we had been planning for his arrival. Um, it wasn't like... We just, you know, we, we had been planning. We had, you know, we traveled to San Francisco. We got the storefront prepared for it. We prepared um, for his arrival by passing out. You know, now they use these, that term strategic planning, right? You've heard that term. Strategic. Yeah. So um, we were strategically planning, even though we didn't call it that. So we knew he was gonna come. So he started passing out these flyers. Said Swamiji is coming, and then we had the Maha Mantra because we didn't know when he was coming, and we didn't have an address yet. But we just started to get the word out, to get the mantra out. We couldn't even chant the whole mantra without looking at that piece of paper yet because we get the words all confused. So then, then we got a um, an address. So the next set of flyers was Swamiji is coming to five eighteen Frederick Street, you know, but there was no date. Then we got a date finally. You know, so we prepared like that to bring him and to announce his arrival. Okay, well, it is 8 30, 90 minutes after this is this a privilege on this. Did Shintamani, she wrote? Oh, she is, uh, she's still in limbo. No. no, she wrote something. As our community prepares for the physical transition of our beloved Bali Maharaj, could you please share from your experience guidance on how to utilize this pastime to both deepen our Krishna consciousness while keeping on awareness, to be in touch with our own feelings of grief and loss and support each other in this way? For sure, in the past, in his gone, there has been the pattern of not being in touch with our full selves, feelings and all, with the desire to focus on the philosophy. What have you seen as the way to balance all of these considerations? Yeah, like in the old days, <laughs> we were pretty dry, we were pretty like kind of artificially stoic um, and on the other hand um, there was you, you don't want to become like a, a, a foolish materialist and totally lose it at the moment of death over somebody and distract that person but I think Gita Nagari is pretty fortunate because for those of you who were present during the departure of Srila Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj you had a beautiful example and there was a lot of feelings there were a lot of emotions but it was all connected to krishna to guru and uh, i think any type of artificial disconnecting is um, not a healthy thing but to become overly externally emotional to the point where you're not even conscious of why that emotion is is coming up you become overtaken with it and then you disturb others that also has to be considered so i mean we have to just temper we we need to face our emotions and we need to share them also but it should be done in a in a in a conscious way t Prabhupada would often say cool-headed way um And I think you all know much better than myself. I think it's a beautiful thing um, when there's a departure, especially with somebody who has uh, 
lot of presence in, in our lives. So we don't want to distract that person. At the same time, we want to share ourselves with others at that time in a way that doesn't just cause them to become um, even discouraged or fearful of the impending departure. I mean, for us, this birth, death, disease, and old age is all on an equal platform, and it's just, it's glorious. A devotee, even, even the most fallen devotee is going to get a bump up in life. That's assured, you know. But to speak of somebody who has dedicated themselves to the service of Guru and Krishna. And, you know. I hope that you've spoken to him about what he wants and doesn't want. I mean, I can tell you what I don't want. I don't want one of those little squawk boxes with digital, you know, saying it's Srila Prabhupada. It's not Srila Prabhupada. You know, I want Prabhupada, but I want an authentic tape of Srila Prabhupada, not a digital, digitalized version. So maybe he has some preferences. Maybe he's expressive. I don't know what, you know, the preparations are. But certainly as much as possible should be observed. Chaitanya Jivan, he didn't want a lot of people around for that reason. He didn't want to be distracted at the end. Just, you know, therefore, most people did not know. I mean, I had known for some time, but I understood I was had been given confidential information. Because um, he didn't want people to disrupt his um, desire to be fully concentrated at that last moment, you know. So that's something that we want to keep in mind, that we don't distract the departing person. Devagi Priti has her hand raised, so please unmute yourself. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Mother Malati, for your class and for your association. I'm so, so grateful to be able to hear from you today. I just had two quick questions. The first was how can we develop deeper relationship with Shil Prabhupada and how can we help that relationship blossom? And the second question was um, how can we, and me speaking for myself, um, my spiritual master, Sasana Swami, so how can we prepare ourselves now and ever for that time when our physical spiritual message will be part of the world because it's like a fear that I have and I know that it's going to eventually take place and just how can we now like start emotionally preparing ourselves for that time so that when it happens I mean of course it's going to be hard but like how can we yeah prepare for that yeah. okay <clears throat> so you asked how we can know more about Prabhupada, how we can deepen our relationship. My god sister, Danishta, asked him that same question. So I will give you his answer. He said, if you want to know me, read Krishna book. Isn't that beautiful? And so that's the answer. I can't embellish it even better. And as far as preparing, our entire life is a preparation for whatever Krishna may give us or not. So the best way you can prepare is to your utmost ability. Keep your um, Krishna consciousness, in, keep, remain in Krishna conscious activities. You know? I mean, the basic thing is, it's not just 16 rounds. Prabhupada qualified 16 good rounds. And that's a basic. Now, if we could just chant one offenseless Hare Krishna mantra, that would be an ecstatic explosion. So until we can do that, we don't have to worry too much about trying to find something else to do. But, you know, maintaining good sadhana, whatever your um, situation may be, and improving the quality of your chanting. Pleasing to Krishna, pleasing to Guru, pleasing to Srila Prabhupada. Sometimes I'm so embarrassed, I'm chanting my rounds and I, oh my God, 
my hands have been moving around the beads and I'm not even anywhere near the mantra that's coming out of my mouth. We have to really work on this. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. So again, I offer my respectful obeisances to all of you. And actually, I'm hoping sometime this year, um, in the near future, that I might be able to once again come to Gita Nagari and take darshan of all of you and our most glorious lordship, Sri Sri Radha Damodar, and the beautiful cows. We'll certainly uh, be looking forward towards that moment in life. Maybe after the snow disappears. <laughs> so let's let's give one more chance to the devotees if they have anything else to add to ask from Malati Prabhu. The Malati Devi Dasi, Malati Devi is fine. Yeah, Devi is actually an exalted uh, title. It's it's like goddess. So it's it's, it's not Malati like Dasi, my prefer if you want my preference, it's Malati Dasi. Okay, well. Well, if the, oh, Lauren has a question, please unmute and unmute, unmute yourself and make yourself visible too, please. Sorry, I'm actually using Lauren's phone. Um, Hare Krishna, Malati Dasi. Hare Krishna. Thank you, thank you for your class. I just wanted to ask, maybe like um, some devotees have like practice better had a better sadhana in the past and then kind of fallen away from it but to like bring them back just this is it just good to like associate and, and read and take prasad with them or is there anything you would recommend kind of so you just gave the perfect answer thank you yeah thank you that's about my only question a, a devotee knows you know but um, if somebody comes and hammers them like doom, 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 it's not going to help them. Although occasionally there has to be like, you know, if somebody's about to walk over a cliff and you shout and grab them, I mean, you know, emergency situation. Otherwise, a more affectionate, gentler approach is the best. Thank you. Thank you for your class. Okay, well, if there is no one else, I, in the name of all of the devotees in Gita Nagari and the surrounding areas, we want to thank you for taking the time out to address us and give us your kindness and wisdom. And someone who is so dear to Srila Prabhupada, and I'm not saying this in a light way, I'm sure all of his disciples and all of his grand disciples are dear to Srila Prabhupada, but he actually, uh, you were actually very, very close in many ways to Srila Prabhupada, and he showed his affection for you, and I'm sure it keeps showing it, and it's transmissible. We can feel that and aspire just to be a, a spark of, have a spark of the good fortune that you have had and maybe we can get your your fortune so Prabhupada would smile upon us he's already smiling on you it's a fact okay Hare Krishna. Thank, you. thank you all right Krishna devotees please tune in tomorrow for more excitement at the uh, godly hours and we'll see you then thank you Malati Dasi Thank you. Thank so you much. very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to all of you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.